Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today moderating this plan panel on the future of inclusive growth. This time two years ago, just before the pandemic, we were speaking of record low unemployment rates and unprecedented labor vacancy rates. In February 2020, we were worried at that time because there was almost half a million job vacancies. Fast forward to today, February 2022, if it were only that easy in so many ways, and although there are fluctuations in the labor market through the pandemic waves, uh, we anticipate that uh, uh, um, employment rates will return to pre-pandemic levels, yet we still now have an unprecedented uh, number of job vacancies, as we heard this morning from Perrin, hovering around 1 million job vacancies across this country. There's vacancies in healthcare, construction, manufacturing, accommodation and food services, uh, along with retail trade that are currently leading the way, yet we have shortages across sectors, uh, across communities and regions, affecting all sizes of businesses. Businesses, including small business, are citing labor shortages as one of their, and if not their most significant barrier to economic growth. Again, as we heard this morning, we also heard that everyday Canadians are concerned about labor shortages in an aging population as well. For the economy to realize its potential and generate broad-based growth, it is critical to ensure that Canada is using all of our available talent. This panel will discuss how our country can foster a more inclusive growth for all segments of the population. It is my pleasure this afternoon, for most of us in the country, it is afternoon, to in introduce today's panel. I'm pleased to welcome Laura Didick, who is the Vice President of Client Diversity at BBC, Chris Fowler, who's the President and CEO of CWB Financial, Mark Patterson, who is the Executive Director at Magnet, and Anthony Veal, who is the CEO of Deloitte. To open this panel and set the stage, I'm going to first ask um, uh, about um, uh, the pre in the pre-pandemic, the country as a whole uh, experienced unprecedented labor shortages, and there's been continuous disruption in the labor market here. I'm gonna ask our panelists what you're seeing now in your respective companies or sectors or trends among your clients. Laura, I'll ask you to take the floor first, introduce yourself and, and talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing. Thanks. Good, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the country, everybody. Um, so BDC is a different kind of bank. Uh, as the only bank devoted exclusively to entrepreneurs, we have one clear and important purpose, and that's to help Canadian small and medium-sized business grow stronger and become stronger so they be, can be uh, they can compete here and they can compete not only here but around the world and so we deal with uh, small and medium-sized businesses all day and we do a lot of our own studies so I was happy to hear um, that ours is very consistent with what Canadians are saying with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce because a recent BDC study of Canadian small and medium-sized business did confirm that 55 percent reported that they are struggling to hire that the workers that they need, not only just to sustain their business, that's not even to grow their business, which is really, really important because to become a stronger economy, obviously we need to encourage growth. And then, as you mentioned, Leah, the scarcity of Canada's labor market is not new. It's been a challenge for, 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 for a decade. And our working population is aging and leaving uh, the labor market. Young people are taking longer to complete their education and begin their careers. And immigration has just not been enough to maintain uh, labor force growth. And then comes along the pandemic and that's just even made it worse. And, and we've seen it even worse for certain demogra demographics of the population. And you know, many baby boomers have accelerated their retirement as a result of the pandemic. And I think everyone has heard about the great resignation that is happening. And it's caused many people to reassess their careers and, and the companies that they're working for and, uh, and really get to, the, to what's important to them. And, to, uh, and you know, a lot of their personal life has, has been disrupted through the pandemic too. And it's, it's forced them to have to reassess you know, the companies that they're working for and the flexibilities that they have. So, and as I mentioned then, you know, with that immigration has even been more stunted by the pandemic. 
So as the economy continues uh, to recover and job market bounces back, I mean, the pressure on employers is just going to intensify. So it's really, really important that um, all companies look at this and address it. Thanks, Laura. That's a, a great introduction. And yeah, we've leaned on that survey quite a bit. Thanks. Uh, sure, we'll be talking about some of the recommendations from that as well. Chris, I'm going to pass it over to you and ask you what you're seeing from, from uh, your perspective, your business, and, and maybe a bit in Western Canada as well. Thank you. Sure, sure. thank you very much, Leah. Um, and uh, Laura, I totally, there's nothing you said that isn't exactly what we're experiencing. Our focus on, is on business owners as well, as we think about our business from Western Canada uh, into a significant amount of growth in Ontario. Um, and labor is absolutely a challenge for the business owner clients that we focus on, both not just to operate, but to scale up as they look at taking advantage of what opportunities economic growth will provide them. So we talk a lot with our, with our clients about culture, about workforce planning, and as they kind of think about how do they support their growth. Uh, there's lots of issues today, of course, there's been absenteeism and frontline operations as uh, we're hopefully working our way through the Omicron and moving hopefully not to, to Pi, which I think is the next uh, letter in the Greek alphabet. But, you know, I think we're seeing some, uh, you know, some curtailment of, of real issues with, with COVID, but we will continue beyond that and be appropriate to that. But lots of making sure that we focus on those areas and particularly we see it in agriculture, you know, challenges with, uh, border crossing for employees that uh, would come from uh, in terms of foreign workers. That's been a challenge with uh, getting uh, the appropriate number of, uh, of employees for that category. We've certainly seen opening and closing with the high contact industries and restaurants and hospitality um, and hotels. Those have been challenges for them to bring staff back on, um, you know, following through the uh, different programs the the fed federal government brought in which were very you know mindful and timely with the canadian emergency wage subsidy and all of these have been critical critical for these these uh, industries and of course they are working their way through and and for them to kind of rise above they do need to have access to to a strong uh, staffing source so they can relaunch their businesses in alberta talking about in western canada a very busy oil and gas sector as uh, we've seen resurgence of pricing and definitely lots of demand. Um, again, that's been historically a tough uh, area to capture employees from and typically that's drawn from all across Canada. So again, we see companies that we deal with in that area to be you know, challenged with uh, getting the right people in the right uh, scale to, to run the business effectively, not just to grow, but just to operate. And in BC, we see that too. So it's uh, there's no question, lack of labor is an operational risk. And uh, the focus we have in our client uh, conversations is to really be zeroed in on you know, how we can support our clients as they look at that area. Thanks, Chris. And that how is what we'll be delving into uh, deeply here throughout. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here today. What would you add as we set the stage here? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Leah. So again, agree with everything that's been said uh, so far. I mean, I think COVID has certainly highlighted a lot of the challenges that existed um, before. Um, it's created, I think, some interesting opportunities as well, which I think we can get into talking about later about thinking differently and being flexible and agile, which I think is going to be one of the, the responses. But I think the um, the thing that I would like to highlight at this stage is, you know, we all probably know people that are unemployed and have been looking for work and trying to connect to jobs, whether it's, you know, the, the child in the basement or, or a friend or relative or, or somebody else that we know. And we all know companies that are struggling to find the right talent to help sustain. So as Laura mentioned, not only sustain their business, but also grow their business. And we think that, you know, despite the amount that there's a, a lot of public funding and investment in supporting, you know, the, the talent ecosystem, the employment and training system in Canada, there's not really an efficient marketplace to make that available or discoverable to companies. 
So I think there's a, an opportunity for collective action, both with companies, government, and so on, to make sure that we're optimizing the use of our talent. There are under utilized pools or pools, we talked already about the great resignation, but before that we had significantly under top pools of talent. So I'll take one example, persons with disabilities. I mean, in Ontario alone, we have about 550,000 supported people on Ontario disability income support, which is a cost to the province of around $6 billion a year for that program. Um, and I've seen studies that show almost 50% of, of the people on Ontario disability support are also have a post-secondary degree. They've somehow um, are now out of the labor market. So when we get into some of the ways that we can think about early labor market attraction, early talent strategies, I think that's really, really important. And we've done some exciting work with uh, large corporations, Deloitte, uh, included with Anthony's team, but on, on connecting on early talent strategies, there are government programs. And I think we can all work collectively to make sure that people from all uh, groups, whether it's newcomers, persons with disabilities or other groups that have faced barriers to employment um, are helping meet the needs of, of employers as well. So excited to be here and to talk about this today with everybody on the panel. Thanks so much, Mark. And Anthony, I see a lot of nodding there. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon. Pleasure to have you. What would you add just to set the scene to the conversation here? Yeah, for sure. Just a couple of ads, if I could. Anthony Veal, CEO of Deloitte uh, Canada, um, largest professional services firm in Canada, about 16,000 people across the country. I just say that because we see all levels of organizations from small through to large. And that's uh, all the comments that have been said I could, I could vouch for. And that's what I hear in the market. I would add that there's two nuances to the pandemic from uh, our perspective that I think has come through in some of the comments, but worth emphasizing. One, the migration of talent from one sector to another sector. I think that's exacerbated some of the shortages that we talked about. Uh, and the second one is the demand from other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the blessing and a curse that the largest economy is only 200 kilometers that way. Um, and you know, with a hybrid working um, uh, model, and with some of the best talent in the world here in Canada, particularly in the technology space and other sectors, um, uh, uh, we, we are very attractive. Um, and uh, that's just pulling more workers out of the Canadian economy as well. So uh, that'll be the two points of nuances that I can add, Leah, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. This sets the stage really well, right? It's all these cliches, right? Jobs without people, people without jobs. You know, the skills that individuals have, the skills that employers need and trying to make that match, Mark. I like your comment on the marketplace. So Chris, I'm gonna ask you to start. Um, what are the, some, some of the best practices you're seeing out there and engaging and ensuring diversity and inclusion are woven into hiring, retention and promotion practices? Thanks. Yeah, so as we think about that, I mean, number one is it's engaging the hearts and minds of our people. And we wanna do that through kind of relentless listening um, and our HR team has coded that as a, as a key theme, like make sure we understand what people, you know, what they're thinking, and we want them to have a real sense and purpose of belonging in our organization. We want to be very focused on actively addressing biases amongst our leaders, amongst employees, and especially as we think about hiring practices. So we kind of putting a bit of a a point on, on listening relentlessly, we want to, you know, really be focused on being curious, get lots of feedback, response. Um, what we have internally is a, a program called Ask an Exec. So it's a uh, ability for all staff to bring questions to, to the executive team, which we respond to. We also do that live as well. So we want to hear what people are thinking, what they is important, and we want to be very focused to ensure when we work through our annual engagement process that that we've got a real view of what is expected what is known and as we think about underrepresented people do we fully understand what's on their mind in the sense of belonging we want to be zeroed in on what are those areas that we can provide more value so we've created these uh, employee represented groups and we have eight of them and uh, we find that that has been a very good avenue for information on 
these particular areas that allows people to have you know a better context and better understanding and that we found that that uptick has been uh, very strong so that that's been a very a good win we think about is we think about biases you know we want to focus on how do we make sure we understand those well so we've got mandatory learning modules for people to to be really aware of as particularly as you're looking at hiring and then we want in hiring and promotion we want to focus on inclusive language we want to make sure that we are targeting non-conventional places where newcomers, women, et cetera, look for jobs. We wanna be really focused on how it is we attract. And we wanna be you know, thoughtful and we wanna have a multi-year plan, we wanna measure, we wanna manage and have a real commitment to how we deliver on how we you know, portray the bank. We have great transparency on pay, um, on equity, and and be focused on our representation targets. We want to be very much uh, online with the very important aspects for us to support uh, diversity. Chris, thanks so much for that. I love all the concrete examples right through an employee's journey as well with the organization. That's great. Mark, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I, I think I'll go back to so completely agree with all the comments, but I'll take my time to talk, I, I think, a little bit about the importance of early talent strategies, especially in, in attracting people to sectors where we know there are labor shortages, especially in engaging um, people that traditionally face barriers to the labor market. I don't think we've seen any other strategy that's more important than early talent attraction. So I would challenge all the companies listening today to think about what is your internship and co-op programs for hiring from high school and post-secondary. Uh, work integrated learning is, is supported um, significantly by the federal government right now. Uh, we run a program where we can actually help uh, pay for 70% of the cost of hiring a student in a co-op position. It's recognizing that there is an investment on behalf of the company to do that, but that invest investment does pay dividends over time. And the, the Canadian government has come in to be a partner in that. So we're able to pay 70% of the salary um, through a program funded by the federal government for companies that are interested. And there are other delivery partners other than Magnet in the country as well. So there are about 17 different organizations that deliver a program. But I think it's really important, especially if we're talking about diversity and inclusion, we see you know, when people are having a hard time connecting to the labor market. So let's go an example again, youth with disabilities. If they're not getting labor market attachment earlier, it becomes more and more difficult and it's not going to be solved kind of midstream down the funnel. Um, we need to, to invest collectively. So we've had, uh, um, you know, really great partnerships as well, working collectively with Corporate Canada, companies like RBC. So we all know about RBC's Future Launch uh, program and their investment in youth and Dave Mackay's commitment around that and Mark Beckles leading the Future Launch team. We actually worked and it was really interesting because RBC, many companies bank with RBC. So RBC worked with us to help uh, let their SMEs and their companies that bank with RBC know about the program. And we were able to, just last year alone, support over 18,000 subsidized placements for students and companies across the country. Uh, Deloitte as well, uh, some members of Anthony's team have been working with us and we're working, Deloitte is another company that's helping connect uh, to their members, to the clients that they serve, to the, the organization. So, that's, that's an exciting early talent strategy and there's support to help companies expand that. Great, Mark, I really appreciate that. Again, I love all these concrete examples and I'm sure it's planting many seeds. Anthony, yeah, Mark says you've partnered with, with them as well, but in that big picture, what are you seeing uh, for some best practices? Thanks. I, I think be better practices start with opening the aperture to all Canadians to participate. Uh, and that's going to require some creative thinking. And, and we've got a, a catch cry here at Deloitte is that we want our representation top to bottom to look like, look like, literally look like contemporary Canada. So that means that we want to open, you know, every um, uh, open opportunity to every Canadian uh, and early talent strategies, Mark, that's an important part of it. But I think what you touched on there earlier too, 
when you were touching on, there is under uh, uh, sorry, there is um, talent in underrepresented groups that are either being uh, underutilized uh, or they're not quite sure how to participate. And I think opening up those doors, we we estimate that that could be up to 1.7 million available workers by 2030, and that is a lot um, uh, of workers. So taking that wider aperture and then putting in place and updating the processes to make sure that we're attractive to Chris's point, we're attractive uh, to uh, uh, the, these, these folk, uh, we're a safe place for these folk to come and join, and we're committed to upskill or reskill whatever is necessary to get them up, up, up to speed sooner. And you know, one of the traps that I think we've got to look out for is that, you know, the, the roles that we have within our organizations are changing, rapidly changing. <laughs> so not exactly like we're looking for the folk that we needed yesterday. It's about being creative and to see the potential in folk for the jobs that haven't been created yet uh, as well. So taking as wide an aperture as, uh, as possible. One last point before, before I hand over here is making commitments around that safety um, element, making commitments and alliances with the likes of, we've got a collaboration with Autocon um, to bring in uh, uh, people with with, uh, with disabilities. We made a we've made a pledge to reconciliation, which includes a a, a hiring and an empowerment of Indigenous business uh, businesses uh, going forward. We have an accessibility action plan where it's a deliberate measures to put in, and we make that public. We actually share that with our uh, with our clients and the public, because we've all got to solve this issue as a collective, as well as our individual needs. So I'll just give examples of some of the other tactics that we're using. Thanks so much, Anthony. And I really like those two words, deliberate and public, uh, among the other things as well. But that, that's something that's really, I've noted here and stuck with me. Laura, I'm going to ask you now too, as well, to speak. What are you seeing? What are some of the best practices uh, from your point of view, thanks. Yeah, so I really love what Anthony said about a deliberate. So I think that's really important. And, and something I jotted down, Chris, I'm going to use it as relentless listening. I, I really, really like that. So, I mean, it, it really starts with, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion starts with inclusion in my mind. We need to make sure that we've created inclusive environments to make sure that that we're welcoming to all. And it's, a, and it's in a safe in, environment to all. And I mean, first of all, I mean, what we think is that you can't improve it, you can't measure. So that's really, really important is we need to make sure that we understand where our organization is at on DEI and then have developed a measurable action plan from there. And second, secondly, and equally important is, you know, commitment and, and accountability um, all the way from the top from the board and, and all the way through the organization and the leadership. And that was, that was mentioned here and that's really important. And, you know, it starts from the inside. What, what we've done is, uh, is, is that through the relentless, the relentless listening, which I liked is, you know, we conduct an, an annual DEI survey in addition to our engagement survey that specifically addresses DEI and how are employees feeling as far as, are they feeling comfortable? Are they, do they feel they have an inclusive environment? And, and, with, and then in addition to that, we've also developed annual listening circles where we get feedback from employees. And it's, it's, a, it's a listening circle on an annual basis that, again, specifically talks and asks questions. And, and the questions and then the listening is really, really important. And then from there, that informs our DEI action plan that the, that has been developed and uh, and then a strategy to attract and retain diverse clients because it's a it's talent because it's it's attracting but it's also retaining what you have and we've implemented a diversity leadership council actually we did this eight years ago and it's been evolving and it's and uh, we're having a, a lot of success with it it's really important and what it is it's made up of 16 senior leaders from across the country and uh, represents all business units across our organization and our diversity leadership council supports our six uh, employee resource groups. And, and Chris talked about those. I think CWU, CWB has something similar. And our employee resource groups are supported by over 60 employees across the country. And the, and the Diversity Leadership Council supports our DEI action plans and making sure that it's being implemented. And then we're also doing things similar to what um, Anthony has mentioned at Deloitte is the training and the awareness. That's super important. And you know, BDC has introduced mandatory internal 
um, learning programs for all employees around DEI. And uh, a couple of these examples are, you know, being an ally in an anti-racist workplace, that training. And then Indigenous History, Identity and Reconciliation in Canada is another training program that it's been mandatory for all of our employees to take. So, so things like that are very important. And I really like Mark's comment about the students. We have a very robust uh, summer student hiring program. And actually my boss started as a summer student with the bank many, many years ago. So it's really important to bring him in young uh, be nice to them when they are young and then and then build and, and train them and, and grow with them because I think that's really important and and uh, you know more organizations need to do this need to do that. Thanks that was just fantastic so many ideas nobody has to reinvent the wheel plug into what's going on plug in somewhere lots of opportunities and as we move forward here uh, this is this is the next question and and panelists I'm going to take the opportunity because questions are pour, pouring in here so I'm going to start combining a little bit here as well but um, Mark I'm going to start with you and say you know going forward what are some of the ways you and and companies as a whole are, are planning to ma maximize human capital potential for inclusive recovery and, and a couple of things, you, you can touch on anything you want, but I'm seeing some questions here on, on Slido already about, you know, as we, we come out of the pandemic, not all of us have been blessed enough to work from home, but many of us have. Companies are struggling with this whole, what does hybrid look like in a lot of ways, but how do you ensure that it's inclusive? We've heard a bit about that uh, earlier today, as well as, you know, around pieces of immigration, although I open the floor to, to anything you want to might want to say going forward. Mark, we'll start with you for this one. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. We're uh, we're using the term um, agile and flexible rather than hybrid. Um, I guess it uh, depends on what it means um, to each group. But we we want to retain some of the things that we've learned that have been amazing. I mean, in, in March of 2020, I think it was March 12th, um, uh, within an hour, our team went remote and we were working remotely. And in some ways, for at least a period of time, productivity rose, I would say. Um, but obviously, you know, we all went through understanding the challenges, how to, how to manage remotely, how to maintain motivation remotely, thinking about mental health and supports and, and supporting everybody when there were a lot of things going on as well in our employees' lives. Um, so we've been doing a lot of thinking ourselves, but also working with a lot of companies we work with about how um, we can keep kind of that flexibility and agility because we talked about some of those pressures um, personally, you know, dealing with aging parents and, and other pressures. We all have things in our life. Um, I think uh, there are more demands and work and and home life is, is in some ways blending um, and that flexibility can be important, but also not expecting our employees to be on you know, 24 seven either. So just thinking a lot about what we learned, that's uh, positive. Um, I think we had, for example, I think one of the great things is we have a lot of employees that are now living um, in maybe um, you know, Northern and or rural Ontario, or there's more flexibility to support employment and access talent. It's also a challenge. As Anthony said, we, we have a lot of our development teams are getting <laughs> recruited by a uh, US. Um, uh, but, you know, I think all of these challenges we're trying to personally think about what worked, but also valuing, you know, the in-person experiences, the getting together, the being back in the office as well. So that's a bit of, of kind of how we're, we're thinking and looking at it. I think there's different strategies for different groups. So if we're talking about underrepresented groups or people facing barriers, so we're talking about, um, you know, it might be a slightly different strategy to attract and retain some of the newcomer talent versus youth with disabilities. I know we, um, have more flexibility and it's often easier for some of our team that have um, physical disabilities, as an example, um, if they can work remotely. So we're looking for ways and where um, the what we've learned about being remote, what we've learned about being more flexible and agile can actually help us um, integrate people in more rural areas, uh, provide more flexibility to people 
um, to work remotely um, and not having a kind of one size fits all, I think is, is kind of the big message. Mark, I love it that, you know, one size doesn't fit all, but more, you know, that positivity around the flexile and agile, right? There's so much concern about, you know, it's called the privilege of proximity, right? Those who will be in the office and those who won't and, and how that will play out going forward as well. So Anthony, over to you for some, some you know, thoughts about going forward and, and getting us out of this pandemic into recovery and into economic growth. Thanks. So um, uh, one of the advantages of a business like ours, we, we measure <laughs> uh, productivity pr pretty well. Um, and to Laura's um, point there earlier, um, you know, what we measure can give us, you know, some confidence of some of the tactics that we're making. And to Mark's point around, um, uh, you weren't calling it hybrid, but agile and flexible, we call it next normal. Uh, we think that's a real opportunity, not only to enhance productivity, but also to enhance wellness, enhance balance and sustainability. Uh, and in, unfortunately, we've had two years of practice to get that right and measure and adjust and measure and adjust uh, to get more effective. One of the things that we've done, which sounds contrary to the, this topic, but we've given our, uh, our people more time off, uh, an additional 12 extra days over and above the typical annual leave requirements and the statutory holidays. And we've found that that's been very important tool to get that balance part because uh, you know it's it's you wouldn't be shocked to hear that you know some of the inefficiencies that are involved in coming to the office every day um, uh, are a lot three hours a day for some people to come in and out of the office and if you can redeploy that three hours to your your, your local commitments if you can redeploy those hours to yourself for health health, health and well-being um, with, then we should be able to you know get the best of both um, if you will. Uh, the, the one thing I am excited about is immigration. Um, I think we're going to have, <laughs> I hope, uh, one million new Canadians in the next three to four years. I hope, hope I'm one of them, uh, by the way. Uh, but, uh, uh, that's a lot of workers coming in. And I think if we're creative, a lot, some of these folk are extremely well skilled. They just can't get a start or a sponsor. So all of us uh, have a voice. Um, all of us have the ability to be that sponsor, use our voice um, to get their credentials recognised, for instance, if it's specialised work, or be creative and, and, and take this wealth of talent that's coming in, which all of our modelling suggests that, you know, migrants are impacting our economy and contributing a lot sooner than we think. And we do it better here in Canada than other jurisdictions around the world. That is a given. So I'm really excited about a million new, new Canadians and what sort of impact they can have on our economy, particularly as the baby boomers are exiting, um, exiting the workforce. Anthony, and thanks for that. We're going to find out next week for sure from the federal government what those <laughs> targets are uh, somewhere between half a million and a million. So we'll see how that plays out. Laura, can I ask you here about some, some best practices, not only best practices, but as we look forward, right, into recovery and into economic grow, uh, growth, how, how we can be inclusive to ensure that growth. Thanks. Yeah, I think, I mean, companies have understood the value of diversity and sustainability and uh, that it'll widen their potential talent pool and keep their employees longer. I mean, I was reading a report, maybe it was a Deloitte report, I can't remember where it was from, but you know, 44% of candidates that were surveyed turned down an interview or a job offer due to the fact that there, they thought there was a lack of diversity in the company's workforce. So, I mean, I have two, uh, two daughters, university age daughters, and I mean, diversity and inclusion is very, very important to them. It's very important to, to younger people. I mean, in new Canadians coming up. And so it's not, it, it's something that needs to happen um, to attract and retain talent. And I think companies are starting to get that. And, you know, companies that are still having trouble recruiting, um, to Anthony's point, I mean, New Canadians, that's, you know, the unemployment rate amongst new Canadians is still higher than it is among uh, native born Canadians, albeit the, the gap is shrinking in, in most recent years because of the, as the labor market has heated up, but it still is. And we talked about people with disabilities, super, super important. There's an opportunity there. Um, youth, 
uh, indigenous, I mean, lots of retired workers. I think that we can learn from Japan and keep older workers active longer by offering more flexibility, offering phased retirements. I mean, that's really, really important, especially because we're going to need those as we're hiring more students. We're going to need that that talent to help train the incoming. And uh, the other thing I wanted to, we talked a lot about hybrid and flexible working and that's something that, that we're offering. And I think it's very important and, and gives opportunities to, uh, to different um, individuals, um, in, including mothers too, that may have kids at home and may have trouble finding childcare if they have uh, sick kids. And so I think that's, I think that's really important because then they have the opportunity to continue working from home and take that stress out of it. But also I think companies need to look at uh, benefits and the benefit plans that they're offering and making and, and make sure that when they look at their benefits, are they looking at it through a diverse lens? Because maybe, you know, when we think of our benefits program, it's probably something that companies have had forever. And, and there's maybe we can find ways to offer more diversity through our benefit program, which is going to then attract more diverse talent pool. Thanks, Laura. And that attraction is going to be key, even for SMEs, right? There's lots of creative ways to do this. You know, I, I'm hearing more time off. I'm hearing, you know, more flexibility as well, right? It's not, it's a combination of things. So, so this has provided some, some needed and good food for, for thought. There's any number of questions coming through here, and I think we'll take a couple. The first I'm going to ask, and Laura, you, you touched on this a little bit about using the example of, of Japan. Um, there's, there's questions here all combined and it's, you know, something, there's a comment here about expiring at, at, at 40, right? And, and, and this idea about what we can do, you know, Mark, you talked about the, the early talent and that, that early entry in. And, and my question would be, you know, how can we use more of those older, more mature workers? Uh, any suggestions how to keep them in the workforce longer? Innovative um, transitions uh, into retirement. Chris, maybe I'll, I'll start with you if you you know anything. And then one, once Chris is done, I'll open the floor to any additional comments. Thanks. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think in terms of the responses on the prior question and thinking about, you know, the the way the workforce is going to flex as we move forward we're talking about it a lot and clearly everybody on this panel is too and you know whether we call it uh, agile and flexible versus hybrid or we use, use all the words i think we're using all those words because i think we need to think about it very dynamically and uh and and when we think about you know bringing uh, new employees into the workforce and thinking of you know you've got the institutional knowledge of people that retire and and uh, not keen for people in their 40s to be retiring early, that's for sure, because you're walking out the door with just a ton of, uh, of expertise that uh, can certainly be of tremendous value. So as we think about all of these opportunities, we want to have a very flexible approach to how we work. And we're, we're really working on to see how we deliver that. We're in the process right now of a, putting in a reconnection period and how then we engage with employees as we think about how we you know, save some of the commuting, but, you know, we're, as we're on this uh, video call today, how do we use technology in a way that is super engaging and, and, uh, you know, it's, and, and I, I know we're all on many video calls for many portions of our day. And how do we make that all work well and it become, you know, supporting how we bring younger uh, employees into the workforce, how we can utilize and lean on the skill and experience of uh, of this idea of having a uh, staged retirement. I, I like that too. I mean, there's lots of great ways to think about this. And and uh, and I think, you know, we've, we have been in a, a test environment for two years and uh, it's, we're going to have a ton of takeaways. Um, we wouldn't be having this conversation in February 9th, 2020. And here we are 2022. And, and I know we're all thinking about it differently. Thanks. Any other additions? Yeah, go ahead, Anthony, please. I think the seniors thing is really interesting for two reasons. Um, one, it's going to be an entirely new industry. <laughs> Again, probably counter to the topic of labor shortages and the like. I think it's going to create a whole bunch of economic opportunity. Uh, so being able to engage seniors in serving seniors is exciting. Um, uh, because if it's not seniors engaging seniors, then it's going to be, you know, other cohorts, which we know we don't have enough of. 
So I think that's exciting. And we've written a little bit about this and we, we can share this at some later time. The other thing that uh, I'll just throw in there as well, it's something to get everybody's head around is this longevity um, is, is, you know, in for a really exciting decade. And what if 100 becomes the, the new 60, um, so to speak, you know, like, I don't think we take a, a, a we don't take an eye off this cohort of, of, of talent, if you will, uh, they're going to be here for longer. Uh, and they're, they're, we touched on it earlier, the experience that they bring to the table cannot be underestimated, particularly when we're talking about reskilling, upskilling, uh, whether it's, you know, underrepresented or underutilized talent already here in Canada or whether it's new Canadians coming along. So I'm really excited about um, this cohort of, of talent and for all the reasons that I just mentioned. Thanks, Anthony. And I like that energy. And I also might be self-serving, but 100 being the new 60 serves us <laughs> <laughs> just, just great. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more question question before the wrap up question and, and combine a couple of things. I think, I think this one is a really good one and, and, and feeds the mind of a lot of our members here in uh, for the Canadian Chamber. Uh, can the panel speak to the challenges faced by SMEs uh, and whether it be you know, finding ways to get job ready talent, external supports um, that are, are, are truly effective. We all know they're their economic engines. We all know they're struggling to keep their, their doors open as are all businesses. And, and I'm gonna tag something onto this that is extraneous a little bit, but the other question coming up and Laura, you talked about this is about targets or numbers or mandates as well on that. If you, you, you can tie that in great and if not, so be it. And, and Laura, I'm gonna put that to you first and then uh, open the floor for others, thanks. Yeah, so I think, I mean, definitely, I mean, we, we touched on some of it. I think, I think SMEs that are having trouble uh, recruiting talent is, uh, so, so number one is um, we're really encouraging to look at their, their operations and, and how can they use automation in some to, to maybe, you know, become more efficient and maybe decrease the, the, the amount of talent that they need because, you know, the shortage of, of talent is not going to happen immediately, so I think that's important. So they're going to be they're going to be um, fighting for talent or competing for for good talent, and so so that's number one is is looking at their own operations and see what can they automate, what can they you know how can they replace. Um, number two is that you know things that we've talked about is is targeting underutilized segments such as. You know, youth, new immigrants, indigenous people, disabled people, uh, people with disabilities, retired workers. So, you know, that, those would be ways that I would look at. I'd also have them look at their, um, you know, the way that they work. So the flexible work arrangements, if they're able to do that, recognizing that all not all of them can, but but then through their benefit plans. Um, and, you know, can, you know, it's not always just the pay that is attracting young people now, it's the flexibility. It's, you know, the fact that Deloitte is giving 12 extra days off, so maybe they can, you know, they can attract people that way. So that, that's the way that I, that comes to mind that I would um, recommend that they look at. Thanks. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, I would just encourage digitizing and re-looking at the way that you do work in your organization. I think in some respects, SMEs are more agile and flexible and less beholden to legacy. Uh, so I'd look at that. There's lots and lots of opportunities uh, to think outside the box and teaming and collaborating with technology organization, hyperscalers, um, and like, you know, the, uh, like Microsoft, AWS and, and Google and the like to enable that. And, I appreciate some of the services industries. You still need people for sure, um, but it, it's the other stuff. You know, can you digitize that? It might be the demand generation that you make for your organization um, uh, would be an example. Once you digitize, then you can redeploy, retrain, reskill. Um, if you digitize, you can potentially access talent, not in your catchment, not in your physical catchment to do, to do your work um, as well. So that'd be my recommendation. Mark, please jump in here. Yeah, I think one of the things this is, I think Anthony and Laura both were kind of alluding to this, but what we see a lot is somebody, especially small businesses that don't necessarily, you know, it's 
a busy CEO, a busy owner that's uh, swamped doing all kinds of different roles and tasks and certainly doesn't have the time to necessarily sit back and think about HR strategies necessarily. Um, but one of the things we've kind of counseled or coached is really thinking, this goes to what Anthony was saying about how you're defining roles, right? So what are the pieces of the role that we can automate? And then I'm able to access a different talent pool. What we see a lot of SMEs doing is piling, almost a, a, a posting or a role that's almost a unicorn, right? And so how am I dividing the roles up or how am I able to automate piece of the role that then allow me to access and be a more open, as we said earlier, to broadening kind of that pool and, and looking at diverse groups and, and, and other people that are non-traditional. And we've also done a lot of work. We have, um, I'll give you an example. A lot of companies will go to post-secondary institutions and they'll think I have to hire from the engineering program or I have to hire from this program. Think about arts and social science, humanities programs, other programs, redefine the role a little bit and think about how to attract non-traditional talent. You know, if you're fishing and the pool is fished out, you're gonna look for other pools. Do the same thing when you're looking to hire. So just really think a little bit more about how you're defining your roles in your company and could you do it differently? It's hard to do that when you're busy and just trying to keep the lights on. And that's why I think, you know, and many of the organizations on this call are doing that, but I think there's some collective opportunity for all of us, larger companies to support their networks of small businesses, help create supports and toolkits. We all need to work together. Um, and then I, I think the other side of it is just making sure we're keeping, I think what we don't have, so back to my earlier comment is, you know, uh, let me give you an analogy. We, you know, if you were an automotive manufacturer and you were building a car that had 18,000 parts in it, right? A complex piece and you had thousands of different parts providers, you realize pretty quickly that you needed a supply chain management system to allow you to understand the availability of different parts and pieces that needed to be on the production line to build my car on X day. What we don't have in Canada and what most countries don't have because we're emerging into the need for being rapidly redeploying talent, we don't have a talent supply chain. We don't have line of sight of supply that's in our employment and training system that we are collectively paying billions of dollars to create and train. Employers don't have that line of supply. They don't know where those pools of talent are. And on, on the flip side, we don't necessarily aren't as responsive as we could be to the evolving needs and changing requirements of business. If you think about how other, other examples like that supply chain example, there needs we need to have better line of sight and we need to defragment the system. There are thousands of amazing organizations and post-secondary institutions training and supporting immigration settlement network, disability employment services, or there are thousands across the country, um, but they're all siloed. They all have a separate job board. They all have separate um, systems. It's very hard for a company to navigate. And I think there are a lot of really talented people. That's why I said earlier, we know people that are unemployed and we know people, companies that are looking. How can we create a more efficient marketplace in our country collectively working together um, so that we can help talent connect faster? I think that's a really big, important uh, policy uh, perspective for the country. And it's something we've been very passionate and working about on across the country with a lot of partners. So that's kind of my, my main focus. We need a more efficient marketplace. Chris, did you want to add something here quickly as well? Well, I, I, I'm mindful of the time and yeah. uh, I, I, I just think it's, uh, these are all great suggestions. And, uh, you know, we think about internally, you know, talent pipeline, employer brand compensation, making sure leaders, you know, provide great direction to, to the, uh, within the work environment and then making sure the employee experience is great. And I think, you know, SMEs can focus on all of those as, as ways to, kind of contextualize how they think about, uh, you know, being an attractive alternative for, for the uh, job applicants. 
Absolutely. And unfortunately, we've got tons of questions, of course, but it's it's time to wrap up. And I'm just going to ask uh, everyone here as we do. Anthony, I'm going to just start with you here uh, very briefly, if we could, as, as we uh, conclude here. Um, uh, what uh, for you has been personally the most rewarding uh, part of the journey for you? Uh, you know, thanks. The, the journey, sorry, in and in, in, in being more inclusive in, in the yes. hiring. Yeah, practices. the DNI journey. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been part of uh, intimately involved in, you know, Indigenous Reconciliation Action Plan. And you can tell from my accent, I am a new Canadian. Uh, we, we I come from a country that's had its, you know, um, uh, challenges and opportunities in that regard as well. And I felt that I've got a real second chance here, a little older. Uh, in a different stage of my career to be part of that um, and working with our professionals in that and with communities has been extremely rewarded and that's what led to our plan and our commitments going forward so I was just to, to make an impact that matters it was uh, that's what I found the most fulfilling. Great thanks Anthony. Laura over to you. The journey has been well. The pandemic has has changed our lives. I think we all we all know that. And uh, there's been good and bad that's come out of it. And the uh, the good has been the resiliency that people have shown and companies have shown. And it's really put a, a focus on the importance of DEI. And and I think that uh, I know that us as individuals and companies were focusing on it before and knew that it was important. But I think this really brought it to the forefront. It brought, it, it advanced us quite a few years from, from a technology standpoint and from a DEI standpoint. So I'm really excited that we're talking about it and I'm really excited for the things to come. Great, Mark? Yeah, so we, uh, I think what's been really exciting for us is, is helping companies connect to talent uh, that help them sustain and grow their business, but especially, you know, the individual stories of diverse talent, whether it's Indigenous youth or, or um, youth with disabilities. I think that's been really rewarding, not only for myself, but also for our team to know that we're able to have that impact and help uh, support um the companies so i think that's been in a really and and you know i think it's really important for the future of our country and and i'm excited to work with you know organizations on this call but also um with the government of canada and i think we all just need to collectively uh, work together on some of these challenging challenging issues but there's opportunity in as well so so it's, it's exciting and factful work so great thanks mark and chris last word to you Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, for me, I think the most rewarding uh, part of this process um, has been our focus on culture. And, uh, you know, we really want to ensure we attract top talent, we retain them, and we want to be a great place to work. So our payback for culture and top talent has been a strong and successful company. And uh, your goal is to win with both your internal and external stakeholders. So we focused on five stated values, people first, relationships gets results, embrace the new, the how matters and inclusion has power. And at the core, that uh, support of inclusive culture has really been a big driver for us. And you know, our reward for that is staff engagement. And that's what you know, I think the takeaways and our, our goal is to be ensured, you know, just ensure that we maintain that momentum. We you know, continue to zero in on the people and I think the, more support you give to people, you more inclusion you develop within your organization, the stronger your organization is. And uh, we're very, you know, very happy with it. And it just, just great results over the last number of years. Great. Well, thanks so much. Thanks to all of you. I think there's a great sense of optimism, possibility, and also some concrete recommendations that we can all take forward here.